Hey. Well, this is Mike Bryan with Blog for Arizona. I'm here with Nathan Davis, who's running for to be my representative in LD9. Uh, he's both running for the appointment uh, that's going to happen later, well, I guess next month in December. Um, he's a slate of, what, 13 candidates last I heard? Or more. Yeah, yeah we'll see. Yeah, with the other, day. yeah, there could be nominations from the floor. So it could be more uh, to serve out uh, the rest of Randy Freeze's term uh, for 2022. Two, uh, and then he'll be running in the primary uh, for the nomination, uh, the, the Democratic primary nomination uh, for the 2023 term. So, welcome, Nathan. Thank you, Mike. It's good to meet you. It's good to see you again. And uh, why don't you just uh, give yourself give yourself a little introduction? Uh, give us an idea of who Nathan Davis is. Yeah. So, uh, born and raised here in Tucson. Um, went through public schools from you know kindergarten through. University of Arizona, um, enjoyed every minute of it, uh, left for a few years for grad school in DC and came back in 2016, uh, mostly to work to get Democrats elected. Uh, you know, I worked on, you know, I volunteered for the Hillary Clinton campaign and, you know, Matt Hines's uh, congressional run, as well as, you know, Pam Powers Hanley and Randy Freeze when, and Steve Farley when they were the LD9 mm -hmm. slate. Yeah. Um, and like everyone else, you know, I assumed Hillary was going to win. I assumed that, okay, yeah, I'll that ride. That was a hard night. <laughs> yeah, I'll go back to D.C., you know, uh, get a job when in, uh, you know, a Democratic office on the Hill, like I had like I, I had been doing as an intern in college. Um, and then, you know, election night happened. Mm -hmm. And that was when things changed. And I, the one upside to it. And, and the serendipity, which, you know, uh, my parents have always you know, told me about, especially my mom in, in business, you know, serendipity is your friend. Um, I end up meeting my wife, you know, because I didn't move back to DC. Um, nice. she, she was here in, in December. I was here in December. We went on a few hikes and one thing led to another. So congratulations. Yeah, when did you guys get married? You. Uh, we got married. We got lucky. We got just before the pandemic, uh -huh. November, 2019. And what's so her name? We just had two years, uh, Taylor Cleveland. She uh, nice. yeah. Um, also from from Tucson. Grew up in or was born in Chicago, but I don't hold that against her. Uh, <laughs> I was born in Chicago, but I don't hold that I against have no, you. Either. No memories of it whatsoever. <laughs> I was born in Cook County Hospital, and they immediately swapped out of the state. <laughs> that seems to be a trend for Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let me get into a couple of those yeah. details. There, uh, you went to undergrad here. Yep. Um, what what did you major in? Uh, I did history and poli sci double major. Um, wow. Yeah. And so I, that is exactly the same as I did. <laughs> I feel like every, everyone did something of the variation, but, yeah. but yeah, I, I did that. I, uh, you know, always enjoyed math and science in, in high school. I took, you know, AP, uh, physics and AP, you know, calc and, and stats and all of that. But when I got to college, I partly as a little bit of rebellion, um, uh, but I always loved history. I always loved political science and, you know, my main, the main people that I, I really looked up to were the individuals who were fighting to change society. And that was, um, something that I thought I could do yeah. and something that I wanted to do, which is why I interned with, um, Congressman Barber, um, in his Tucson office. And that was, that was the thing that really got the poli sci out of the way. You know, I really started thinking in terms of what does an elected official do for the constituents, um, you know, working to make sure that veterans got the benefits and, and seniors got the benefits that they that they had earned, making sure that... What does your experience tell you about that, that question? What does a representative do for his constituents? <laughs> they need to listen. That's, that's first and foremost. And that's the thing that I, I really saw with Congressman Barber. And, and everybody from his office and, and people who came from Gabby's office too, is is they were excellent listeners. Um, and not just that, they didn't just wait for people to come to them. They, they you know, went out, you know. Um, uh, Congressman Barber, you know, kept up what Gabby had, what, what Congresswoman Giffords had done. Yeah, um, which cost with, uh, her considerably. Yeah, yeah, no, that was, um, yeah, that was, that was terrible, but it's, you know, 13 years ago when that happened, I think that that was just a tremendous shock that really um, hit our community out here. It hit, you know, the, the broader 
political community in, in America, this, this attempted assassination, which we hadn't seen for so long. Yeah. And it is so unfortunate that looking back 11 years, you know, nearly, nearly, yeah, that uh, it doesn't feel out of the norm anymore. Um, yeah, unfortunately, it seems it, like it's becoming much more increasingly common for violence to be a, a part yeah. of the rhetoric of politics. Yeah. How do you feel about that? It's unfortunate. It's really unfortunate. Um, you know, I'm I'm an American first before I'm a Democrat. Uh, you know, my entire dad side of the family are Republicans. You know, if I if I couldn't get along with people who didn't share the same beliefs, I mean, I couldn't go home for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so are they like reasonable Republicans or like radicalized Republicans? Yeah, it depends depends on who. Once once you get a little further, you know, you get to my, my cousins a little further out and they start to get a little a little kooky. Um, most of my family are are uh, teachers and so they were kind of grounded there. My, my dad was a, a teacher, loved John McCain, um, very libertarian stances on, on a lot of policies, uh, but, you know, supported <laughs> public education to the hill. Um, but, you know, it's part of the rural culture. It's part of being, you know, frankly, back home, uh, back in Illinois, part of being Baptist um, and a farm and coming from a farming community and a farming family um, is everybody is just a Republican. And that's weird. Like a couple, two generations ago, it would have been just the opposite. Everyone would have been, everyone would have been a Democrat on the farm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, land of Lincoln. And so so out there that uh, that that runs strong. Um, yeah, but so it's, it's unfortunate that we see, that we can't, that we can't find commonality with regular everyday people. I understand a member of Congress or a member of the legislature not being able to see eye to eye with, you know, with someone on the other side of the aisle. That's perfectly reasonable. You know, mm -hmm. I don't believe that we need, you know, every member holding hands in Kumbaya, you know. It's okay to have political disagreements. It's okay um, to to be very passionate about those disagreements. Yeah, one would hope so. It's exactly. the foundation of our society and Ab our politics. Absolutely. You know, but what we need is really a government that is responsive to elections. You know, because right now what we have is we can have divided government very easily, and we can have a situation where both sides can yell at each other without getting anything done for the people, and. You know, I think that's why we see a lot of flipping back and forth. You know, one side wins, then the other side wins, and the other side wins. It just goes back and you forth. You talk about like nationally that. as Na opposed to state nas politics. Nationally a lot, yeah. Here here a little bit less too. I think here the flipping back and forth we can see within the parties. Um, but I think it's because the American people and the people of Arizona don't see what is being done for them. And I think that that is an issue that is bipartisan, unfortunately, and is, is unfortunately built into our system. And you know, as many political commentators have, have said, it's not a kink in the system, it's a function of yeah. the system we have. So how would you approach the, the job as a representative, given your background and your beliefs, and try and make things better in the state legislature? So for our district, I've, you know, I've knocked on doors in our district for you know, years now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as, as a volunteer and as a candidate myself when I ran for the Nampi School Board. What I would do, you know, twofold, you know, thinking in terms of, of the constituency um, and the voters, making sure that that I'm going to them, that I'm available to them, you know, could be going to you know local community meetings, um, you know, knocking on someone's door, making the phone calls, um, making sure that I'm available to speak with them, not blocking everybody left and right. Um, in terms of policy, there's kind of it's kind of a twofold question because there's there's an answer for this appointment that I'm going for, mm. and there's an answer for the full term that I'm running for. Well, we've got time. Yeah, great. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, for the appointment, you know, this is finishing out, you know, Dr. Freeze's term. Yeah. Um, there. And thank God for Dr. Freeze's oh, wonderful policy. Oh, yeah. Seven. Major seven amazing years and two massive shoes to fill you know and that's that's anybody who gets it yeah i was i was shocked to to hear that he wasn't going to run for cd2 oh, and, yeah. and stepping down from the from the state house i was yeah devastated. yeah no and and especially with with 
you know, his, his colleagues, you know, stepping down too, is that this is going to be, this is, it, it is important that we have, you know, people who understand what needs to be done up there. And, and obviously I have my own interpretation of that. Um, for the appointment, what I am really focused on is, okay, well, taking a step back, there's going to be 31 Democrat, uh, Republicans and there will be 29 Democrats in the state house. Yeah. That will not change nope. in the first week of January when everybody you know, takes their seats. Yep. Um, we're in the minority and we've seen what happened last session. You know, we all remember the insane bills, the fact that you know, it, they took, uh, uh, the Republican majority took until I think early June mm -hmm. or nearly June uh, to get a budget passed. Yeah, and because then they had they, to lob roll it. Exactly. Um, so for this appointment, I really think what we need is someone who can go up to Phoenix and continue the good work that Dr. Fries has done. And I think one of that, and, and with the work that um, that, that uh, Representative Powers Hanley has done too, mm -hmm. which is really shining a light on on these bills that are being put forward. You know, Democrat bills don't get hurt. Mm -hmm. They they just don't. We yeah. you know go. If you Unless ever have, you know. You know, hand one off a uh, relay style to a Republican who who doesn't mind. Exactly, and it's 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 terribly unfortunate, but that's just the fact. You know, I can go up there. I have I have ideas. We're, we're we'll get into what I'd like to get done after a full term. But you know, if I go up there and I propose a constitutional amendment for ranked choice voting, or I put forward a bill to ensure that we follow the Arizona Constitution and that and that tuition at our public universities are as free as possible, direct yeah. quote from it the Constitution. Yeah. It's not gonna go anywhere. Yeah. What what we need Sorry, from I'm January- i adjust the camera oh, no here. Problem. Let me know when it's good. Frame. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Uh, what we need from January till, you know, inshallah, May, <laughs> if we're not lucky, June. Um, uh, what we need is somebody to go up there, pay attention to what's happening, um, read the bills, read the experts that are being brought in and mm -hmm. the evidence that's being brought in. Mm -hmm. That's that's a really interesting area. Um, and communicate to the LDs, the PCs, to, you know, um, Bonnie at, at PCDP, uh, what's going on, put it in words that everyone can understand, and make sure that we raise some noise about it. Yeah, I, that's one of the things I always wrote, liked about uh, uh, Farley and Hanley. Uh, yeah. And Lee Powers, you know, they communicate very effectively with their constituents. So Absolutely. Do you have any specific plans about how you're going to go about that? You're going to have a weekly report or start a blog or anything like that? I have problems with social media, but unfortunately, social media is the best way. Um, I think that supporting local media and having um, articles and opinion pieces in local media, the Daily Star, the Sentinel, etc., um, can be very effective. Local blogs are a great place as well. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, uh, getting getting the word out that way, but then also just you know who are who are the people that are going to put the word out? You know, making sure that you know you're in communication with um, you know Susan and Bonnie, especially uh, making sure that you're reaching and for out. The watchers, who's uh, that? Uh, Susan, uh, making sure that you're reaching out to Susan Bickle, mm -hmm. um, the the chair of LD Nine, and Bonnie Heidler, um, the chair of the uh, Pima County Democratic Party, um, both of whom I've, I've served with on, on boards in both LD9 and, and uh, the county, and we're lucky we have um, both these great women uh, running the show down here. Yeah. Um, reaching out to them, communicating to them. Uh, so working, it's kind of working from the top down in terms of the democratic structure, working from the outside in in terms of uh, media and blogs, and then from the bottom up in terms of social media, uh, as well as um, email lists to you know uh, the PCs and, and other donors and supporters, and you know knocking on doors, you know, and you know that brings me back to you know moving on from uh, the goals of the appointment to the goals of uh, a full term in in 2022, 2023. Mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, this position, uh, we need a Democrat who is not just gonna go up there and, and hold down the fort while, you know, while Randy steps down. We need someone who is going to expand the map. Um, 
Most of us have seen the draft maps that the Independent Redistricting Commission has put out. Mm -hmm. Most of us are not terribly happy about it. No. Um, we've seen that they are going to gerrymander as much as possible. It appears that the end map is going to be 14 or 15 very safe Republican districts, 12 to 13 decently safe Democratic districts, maybe two or three toss-ups. Um, one of the things, though, that is important is if the draft map, I'm trying to remember exactly the numbers, if the draft map for LD18, which currently runs from the Casas Adobe's neighborhood in southern Oro Valley through the foothills, avoiding north central Tucson completely, and then over the east side around Harrison Road, that's a Democratic leaning district. It is not an impossible pickup for a Republican. Mm -hmm. You know, we saw, you know, uh, 10 years ago, six years ago, when we had Ethan Orr win in LD9, when we had Todd Claude Felter win in LD10. Um, it's possible. And it's incredibly important that we have someone in the legislature who's up there saying, hey, this is what's happening. You know, who's informing the PCs, but who then who also is, you know, calling here every day, calling constituents, calling voters, um, knocking on doors um, whenever they can, and, and you know, giving Democrats some, someone to vote for. Because it's, it can be really tricky when you have these redistricting and you have a situation where it's very clear that the primary is going to be important. You know, the LD18 or whichever LD I'm running in, probably 18 is the number. Um, that primary is going to be incredibly important. It's going to be, my guess, a lot of us on the ballot. That race can't end at that primary. And we can't have anybody who thinks that that race ends at the primary. Yeah. We've got to go straight forward because we have to increase turnout to make sure that we have a Democratic governor, a Democratic attorney general, and we keep Mark Kelly in the Senate. And that comes down to Pima County. Maricopa County was about even. Rural Arizona and Pima County were about even as well. We had about 30,000 more votes here than every county besides Pima and Maricopa. So what that really tells me is that even though a lot of people in the Phoenix metro area don't want to pay attention to Tucson, we are going to be the weight that swings this election, just like we were getting President Biden and getting Mark Kelly in the Senate. Yeah, certainly the Republicans on the ARC, AIRC believe that's the case. Absolutely. <clears throat> well, let's uh, expand the scope a little bit, yeah. step back a bit. Um, so you, you majored in politics uh, major and double majored in, in history, but yeah. I understand you also went to grad school in DC, you said. Yeah. What was that? Uh, so I graduated a semester early. Um, I had been interning in Congressman Barber's office mm -hmm. since I, let's see, I went to study abroad in Costa Rica. And so for a year and a half or two years, I uh, So then you probably speak with, Spanish. Yeah, a little bit. The problem with growing up in, in Tucson is that everyone takes about one or two years of Spanish in high school, and they forget it. <laughs> yeah. Then we take it in college, and we forget, and we forget it. it. Then we go abroad, then we and forget, we forget it. it. So, you know, give me a week down in down in Sonora, and I'll, I'll come up speaking we'll a lot better. Back but, up. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so, my basically, my last semester of, of college, instead of, I, I graduated a semester early, and I spent that last semester um, in D.C. Uh, interning in, in Ron Barber's D.C. office. Mm -hmm. um, in the meantime, I got an acceptance letter to the George Washington University um, in the Elliott School for International Affairs, um, which I was incredibly excited about. I am now the third generation in my family to get a master's degree, um, which I'm incredibly proud of because my great-grandfathers were all farmers. Um, and I, I want to, I'll get back to that story because that's, uh, that'll be important later on. Okay. Um, but, but yeah, so I got my master's degree in international affairs, um, graduated cum laude. Uh, I just slipped that in there. May, 2016. <laughs> yeah, just, just a little bit. I, you know what? I didn't realize until I got my diploma from the U of A that I graduated with honors and yeah. I was just like, Oh, this is neat. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so that was May, 2016 is when I graduated from GW. And I kind of looked at the field, um, and I said, uh, you know, I, I kind of looked at it, and I was like, okay, so I'm seeing, you know, a lot of people they work on they work on campaigns, 
then they come back to DC. I knew I wanted to work on the Hill. I love doing it. I love the policy. I love the constituent services. So came back here. Um, also, I haven't seen my family for a while, so you know, it was a good time to come back and enjoy Tucson. Um, DC is great in a lot of ways, but it's very flat and there's a lot of people. So it's nice to come back here and be able to be in the desert with mountains again. Uh, hit the ground running, volunteering for, as I said, you know, the Hillary campaign, uh, the Clinton campaign, the Heinz campaign, um, uh, Pam, Randy, and, and Steve. Um, and yeah, had that, had that very odd experience. Um, but from that, you know, I, I, like I said, I stayed here, uh, and I wanted to figure out what I could use my master's for. You know, I, I studied um, international affairs. I focused on economic development. Mm -hmm. I realized that I didn't necessarily want to do the NGO thing and the USAID thing. I really wanted to be on the ground helping out. And after the election, I kind of had to sit down like the rest of us and figure out, well, what, what the heck am I going to do? Yeah, well, there's areas in the United States that sometimes feel like uh, they need quite and a bit of development. The, the place where I found is <laughs> I was able to take advantage of the subject matter expert certification um, here in the state of Arizona to teach. Um, like I said, my entire dad's side of the family are, are teachers. Um, and so I became not just the third generation to go to, to go to college and have a master's, but the third generation to, to teach. Um, and so I, I went into the classroom. I taught seventh and eighth grade social studies at Lawrence 38, uh, Go Lobos, um, uh, with an amazing group of coworkers with just the greatest group of kids. Um, and I loved every minute of it. And it was so much fun to be able to kind of break out um, what I had learned in grad school and talk about contemporary issues um, and, and, you know, really help the kids understand the nuances of what was going on in, um, in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that perspective really helps uh, somebody in state politics, too, because yeah. so much of what the, the state government does is education. I mean, it's yeah. a major, major slice of our of our budget. Um, so having that perspective, I think, uh, can really help somebody in state politics. How, how do you feel that that experience could help you uh, in your desired new role as a representative? So I taught at a school with an F rating. And I bring that up for a very specific purpose. My kids internalize that. You know, yeah. they, they believe that that the school's failure was their failure. Yeah, you know they vocalized it. They 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 believed it, um, and it wasn't their fault because I could look back at every single one of my kids' records, and I could tell you before I ever met them, before they stepped foot in my classroom, how they were going to do, and it was all based on you know how they did on third grade standardized tests. Wow, were they at level or were they not? The kids who were below grade level in third grade never caught up and it's because we have a system where we do not fund pre-k um, we are fortunate that TUSD and find most of the districts around here have all-day kindergarten but the state of Arizona does not guarantee all-day all day kindergarten we have elementary schools uh, with out full-time teachers with long-term subs and we have elementary classrooms you know, packed to the gills. Yeah. And as a teacher, I will tell you and everyone listening to this right now, if you have 35 kids in your classroom and about a third of them are reading four grades, four levels below grade level, about another third of them are one or two grade levels below. Mm -hmm. Uh, nearly a third of them are at grade level and you got one or two kids who are, who are way advanced and I always had a few that were way up there. You don't have time. You can't manage the classroom. You can't focus on the kids in the way that you know, that needs to happen. And you have to pick and choose. Um, you do triage. And, and it is insane to me that that is the experience of our teachers in the United States. And for God's sakes, look at look at the look at the, 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 the homes on the mountain. You know, look at the homes up on, you know, in, in the foothills. Mm -hmm. You know, multi million dollar homes. Many of them many of them empty. 
we have that kind of wealth. Jim Click is a billionaire. Paul McCartney lives up there. Yeah. We have that kind of wealth in this country, and we can't afford updated textbooks. We can't afford to fix AC units. We can't afford to hire teachers. You know, we can't afford to put in the investment into mm -hmm. these kids. And what happens is you don't invest in the kids when they're three, four, five years old. You're going to invest in them when they're 16, 17, 18, and they enter um, the juvenile correction system. Yeah. You know, that's where it is. You're paying for it one way or another. Either you're, it's the same thing of, you know, you put, if you put 10 grand in the bank right now, in 30 years, you're probably gonna have 40 or 50 grand. That's the investment that education should be seen as. It should be seen as no different than putting money into the into yeah. the Dow Jones. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, most studies will tell you that uh, investing in early edu yeah. early education is one of the best investments you can make. It yeah. pays off in, in tax revenues down the road absolutely. three or four times over easily. Absolutely. And so, yeah, it's insane to me that we're, and an embarrassment that Arizona is 50th in the country yeah. in, in funding our education system for yeah. people. We absolutely don't have to. And we don't even have to reinvent the wheel. That's, that's the thing, is this is, not, this is not a mysterious problem that no one knows how to do. Yeah. You know, this is, you know, I've been watching, rewatching the foundation, the foundation series, and you know, the big thing is the Abraxas equation in there, which is just some, you know, made up math, uh, I think it's made up. Um, I didn't major in math. <laughs> I think it's a MacGuffin. Uh, yeah, so, but it's just, it's just this math equation that no one knows. And I feel like sometimes we, you know, we, we like to think of like, oh, well, how can we, you know, do education? How can we make it um, better? What tricks can we do? And it's, it's, it's really so much more simple than that. Invest in the kids. You know, make sure that, you know, there's not too many of them. Make sure you're paying your teachers at an internationally competitive rate. By not too many of you mean not too many in, not too many in many each students. classroom. Yeah, yeah. So really <laughs> not, not, too, exactly. not too many kids. <laughs> have all the kids you want. We need kids. Exactly. Um, but but yeah, have and make sure so you know your your kindergarten classes, they ought to be, you know, in the ballpark of a dozen kids. You know, ten to fifteen is a good zone. You wanna have you wanna have some, you wanna make sure that they learn how to play nice with each other. Um, they can work and learn in a group. Um, by the time you get to high school, it's okay to have twenty some odd kids in the classroom. That's fine, you know. Especially if they're, you know, have some self discipline. Some, exactly. Some some self control, awareness, you know. Exactly. Some competency and you know, studying on yeah. their own. Yeah. So you do that. Um, you invest in, uh, you know, universal pre K. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the the DC system is a great example of something that uh, can be adapted. Um, and then the other thing is give them a goal give the kids a reason to to be in school give them a, a reason to think like this is why i'm here give them a passion you know yeah. yeah now if you so you know i grew up in a household where i was told you know you're going to go to college you know that was always the thing is you're going to go to college um and so i had that ever since i was growing up i also grew up you know you know middle class dad was a, a teacher mom uh, owns a small business um, we grew up, we grew up okay. Uh, and so college was never a question for me. You know, the students that I taught, a lot of them, college was not on their mind when they're in middle school. Now, part of that's middle school. I, I, my favorite Nothing thing. Nothing much is on your mind I know, in middle school. <laughs> my, my favorite thing is I just, I, so my wife teaches at Pueblo High School. Um, I went there, uh, we're, we're hosting a foreign exchange student this year, um, because, you know, I needed one more thing on my plate. Um, but we... <laughs> We absolutely adore having him. Uh, he goes to Pueblo as well, and I went to um, speak with the counselor to get him all set up with his classes and everything. You know, it's a new, new school, new country. Um, and I saw two of the students that I taught last year. I had them for two years in a row. Um, and I asked them the same question I'd asked them a lot, a lot when they were in middle school. Where are you going to go to college? Um, and one of, <laughs> one of them said, I don't know. And I said, that is great. She was just like, Mr. How is that good? I'm like, cause you said, I don't know. You said, you didn't say I'm not going. Yeah. Um, and I, I loved that. And you can get that investment, um, get that, get the, or not that, well, kind of an mental investment for the kids, but you can get that sense of purpose to the kids um, fairly cheaply. Um, so we have, uh, I think they're 529 uh, plans. Uh, where you can put money into a, basically a, sa a no-tax savings account for mm -hmm. students. It can be used for college later. Um, I believe New York has a system where they automatically put in a, a fairly small amount 
for each student um, to use in college. Uh, but the great thing is that it's an investment vehicle, which means that if you put a thousand dollars in when they're five, you know, that's going to double or a little more than double by the time they go um, to college. If we, Probably more than double. Yeah. yeah, I mean, generally I double every seven years at a reasonable rate. Yeah. So if we had, essentially, every you know, child born in Arizona gets this investment fund, mm -hmm. the state of Arizona puts in a modest sum, um, we make sure that every parent knows that it's there, we make sure that every parent and student knows how much money is in it and how it's grown, um, we can plant the seed in every kid's mind that I can go to college. Yeah. I've got this fund. I've got six thousand dollars. Sounds a bit like uh, Booker's baby bonds. Yeah, it, it's 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 similar. But you know, the thing is, the thing that's different when Cory Booker ran for president, he was the commencement speaker at GW, and I, I absolutely will love him always. Um, uh, one of the differences is that the federal government has is you know the federal government is a twenty trillion dollar economy that it's it's running with, it's working with, you know. You know, baby bonds at the federal level, you can do, you can just do a lot more when you have that kind of resources. In the state of Arizona, we are more limited, um, both by our, the size of our economy and our population, as well as just what we can realistically do. And limits on our ability to tax yeah. based on our constitution. Yeah. Some unfortunate right turns we've taken. You can also get into that one later, too. <laughs> you can get into um, that one right now if you yeah. want. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, but uh, so wrap up the Booker thing. Um, we can absolutely do something similar here. And, you know, every dollar you spend on education fights inequality. You know, every dollar that you give into one of these programs, these 529 programs for the kids, if you start this, you make it universal, you make sure everybody knows about it, it's going to fight inequality. It is going to make that gap. Uh, uh, for, for a first-time college student, a little bit smaller, mm -hmm. you know, to make sure that they know that they can go there instead of, you know, instead of working as, you know, a mechanic, you know, they go and they become an engineer. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a mechanic, but you know, it's more beneficial to be <laughs> a ben an engineer. You yeah, higher salary. Yeah, so. I've got friends who work at uh, who who are electrical engineers and computer programmers. They work at Amazon, and I can tell you, they make a lot more than I did as a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that's unfortunate. We should have teachers paid a lot better. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, taxes. So. One of the unfortunate things that happened here in the United States, here in Arizona in the 80s and early 90s is we had a bunch of constitutional amendments that were put forward, passed by the people, put in the Constitution in the normal way, and they essentially made it impossible to get a lot done. Uh, they, it, it requires super majorities for certain things. The, the worst one is, well, there's two that I, that I really want to highlight. One is it requires a supermajority in the legislature to increase what the state can uh, pay for uh, for education. Yeah. Um, there's a cap on that. We all, I think we all, uh, most of us learned that for the first time a few weeks ago when we picked up the newspaper and it said- the Rude awakening. Yeah, that-, that We all oh, voted to raise the- We voted, exactly. Yeah, to, raise, to raise taxes for education. Exactly. You can't the spend people it. Spoke. Yeah. <laughs> that, the circle back around to that one. So we've got that issue. And we have another one, and this is twofold. We've got the Constitutional Amendment requiring any tax increase to be done by a supermajority, and we have an Arizona Supreme Court ruling saying that getting rid of a tax cut is the same as raising taxes and requires two thirds majority. Yeah. Meaning, any time we cut taxes, it stays cut. Exactly. Yeah, it's a one way ratchet. Yeah, and and that has, you know, we saw this with, you know, it's not. It, there's a reason why with a billion plus dollar surplus that Doug Ducey and the Republicans decided now was the time for a flat tax. Yeah. You know, what they did is that they tied our state's hands when a future recession happens. That's what happened. Yeah. We've got a billion dollars in the rainy day fund. Ducey didn't do anything with that when our schools were you Despite know, struggling. It was pouring. Just, yeah. <laughs> Just... Despite the th the monsoons occurring, the rainy day fund stayed secured, mm -hmm. you know, in a hole in the ground. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know what Doug Ducey would consider a rainy day. 
Um, my guess is if you have a massive fire that hits the homes of the millionaires in you know <laughs> the foothills of the Sky Islands in Scottsdale, we're going to see them tap into that money to, to help some people out. Um, but for you know you and I and everyday Arizonans, that that money is essentially gone now. Rather than taking, so I've got issues with how he did that, but. AB says we're saving it for a real emergency. We're saving it for a recession that lasts years and years and years. We're saving it for in case there's another great recession. You know, let's imagine that Ducey, you know, cares about the people of Arizona. You know, what he could have done is taken that billion and a half dollars in surplus, stuck it in the rainy day fund, add money to it. You know, a billion dollars is not a lot when you have a multi-trillion dollar economy like Arizona. Yeah. You know, add money to that. Keep the, you know, keep the taxes the way they were. But instead... Ducey essentially used the surplus to cut taxes for the wealthiest. For the wealthiest. Yeah. yeah. If you're, what is it? If you make less than $70,000, you'll get back, I think, a couple of bucks. You know, two double double, like a couple double doubles from uh, In and Out. Yeah. And if you're, you know, like Doug Ducey, you're a multimillionaire, I think you can buy, buy a new Maserati. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, disgusting. those are, yeah, and, 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 you know, that's, that's one of the things that we really have to look at. There are elements of our constitution that have clearly um, gotten away from the intended progressive democratic nature of the Arizona constitution as it was adopted 109 years ago. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I wanted to circle back around to uh, in terms of in terms of that is, you know, this idea of, you know, what is, th this idea of like, how democratic we should be, because I feel like that's become back in vogue. You know, it's not just, you know, 16 year olds in government class who are talking about yeah. like, well, you're well, not talking about big D Democrat, you're talking no, about little, no, little D, D Democratic. Yeah, thinking about, you know, the, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the people having, you know, the power. Um, and I think this goes back to uh, Prop 208 and the ruling that, oh, well, Prop 208, you know, doesn't comply with this section of the Constitution, which, you know, requires supermajority to, you know, raise uh, the amount that can be spent at, uh, by, by public schools. It is, should be, it's clear to me, but I think we need to make it clear to uh, the judges in Arizona by passing a constitutional amendment that says if a initiative is passed by the voters in Arizona, it should just be considered constitutional, right? Yeah. We shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't have this thing where voters and- The last generation binds the current generation. Yeah, but we also shouldn't have a system where voters have to have to think like constitutional lawyers yeah. and have to be like, well, is this, you know, does this adhere to the constitution? You know, do we, you know, how, how can we make sure this is, you know, if it's passed, the Especially when it's an arbitrary, you know, procedural roadblock to, oh, yeah. to legislative action as yeah. opposed to, you know, direct democratic action yeah. by, the, by the voters. You know, yeah. this isn't the majority of people, you know, saying that we're going to establish a state religion, yeah. you know, and, and, and questioning, you know, the hundred year doctrine of the First yeah. Amendment. Yeah, it's the voters you know. setting, you know, budgetary priorities. Exactly. You know, and, and frankly, that's one of the issues with... Uh, the Republican Party in general and in the state of Arizona mm -hmm. is that, you know, they are not the party of, you know, freedom and liberty. They're not the party of uh, constitutional rights. You know, it's the party of, I know what's good for you and, and, and this is what it is. You know, they're, it, it's a, it's an authoritative, it's an authoritarian leaning patriarchal um, and pejorative uh, uh, party that wants to dictate what the vast majority of us uh, can do. It's um, it's that I can't remember which philosopher said this, but it's the um, what the strong do what they want and the weak do what they must. Sounds like Nietzsche. Yeah, it's pro probably. <laughs> um, and it's this, and that's that's basically the morals of you know the morals of the Republican Party right now. You know, I have a bigger stick, and than you. You know, and they're gonna and they're gonna wield it, and they're using the apparatus of the state to do that, and it's incredible, incredible to see the transformation from, you know, my dad's Republican Party. You know, and, and dad passed away eleven years ago now, 
Um, but, you know, the Republican Party and, and the ideals that, that he taught me when, you know, I was on his shoulders at John McCain's rally in 1999. Uh, <laughs> And it's unfortunate because we're a two-party state. And when you have one party go off the rails like this, it can drag the entire nation down. Yeah. You know, it's what we've seen for the last, I was going to say five years, but really since the Tea Party. Arguably the last 30 years. Or but, Bush. Yeah. <laughs> or keep going. Honestly, okay, yeah. yeah. It's turtles all the way down. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. I think they made a, a compromise with the devil back in uh, the Reagan years, and it's uh, increasingly begun to bite them in the butt. I think the last time I truly appreciated and agreed with her, the Republican, not in my lifetime, but when um, uh, when President Eisenhower was asked uh, what good thing or what accomplishment his vice president um, Richard Nixon had done when he was running for president in 1960. I think President Eisenhower said something to the lines of um, if you give me the week I might be able to think of something. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, Eisenhower would certainly be considered at least a squish, probably, well, definitely a rhino, and maybe even a Democrat at this point. Oh, you know? uh, yeah. So let's, uh, let's take a bigger scope view. Yeah. Um, in your personal history thus far, kind of what, what is your most proud achievement or position that you've taken uh, that you really feel has prepared you for this next uh, stage in your career? Politically, mm -hmm. I think or personally, I, was, I mean, yeah. But it, you know, it involves I, your politics. Well, let's do both. Um, personally, it was it was teaching middle school. Yeah. Um, that is, you your know. Your passion I've, for that, for yeah. education really comes through. Yeah, um, you know, I've, I've you know, been told by you know a lot of people that I, I take their advice very seriously. You know, politics is a blood sport; you need to be ready for it. You know, I've taught middle school. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it on! <laughs> uh, yeah, um, you know that experience is, is incredibly eye opening. You know, seeing seeing how policy trickles down to um, to the people, to you know, to kids. You yeah. know, um, seeing what effects it can make. Um, not just in the classroom, but just psychologically with the kids, you know, talking about the, um, the F rating, you know, how they internalize that. Um, how it was all based on one standardized test that they took. Uh, politically, it was running for the Amphi um, school board last year. Yeah. Um, Tell me a little bit about that. I'm also in so, Amphi. So. Uh, so, the Amphi district, the thing that I that that really lit the fire into me it was you know talking I, I'm from there you know I went through Harrelson Cross CDO um, and I, I noticed a very very worrying trend which is that the teachers that I had who were amazing were all retiring and you know good for them the problem is there weren't the people with the 20 25 years experience to take over their positions um, and when you look at a histogram of, of teachers in Amphi and, and across the state in general, what you see is, um, I hope this comes out correct on, on there, what you see is, so if you have a histogram right here, mm -hmm. think of it like a bar graph, yeah. and you have uh, teachers by experience, you know, number over here, years of experience here, 0 to 5, uh, 6 to 10, 10 to you know, 20, and then 20 plus. What you see is a large number of teachers with one to five years of experience. A little less, five to ten, a lot less, ten to twenty, and then it jumps back up for twenty plus. Here's what that tells me. We've got a time bomb in education. We've got a lot of teachers. You know, this is Arizona didn't always used to be 51st in the nation, um, behind, behind every state and the District of Columbia. Yeah. In the early nine, late eighties, nineties, we were okay. We weren't great. Middle of pack, thirtieth in the nation, thirty second in the nation. My God, if if a governor could get Arizona to thirtieth in the nation, in you know this the year of our Lord twenty twenty one, that person would be made king. Yeah, it's a, um, would be a miracle. But we have a lot of teachers who began their who began their education career in late eighties, early nineties and have stuck through it. And we have a lot of teachers in other states who began their education career here and left. Because they made thousands of dollars more in other states. Exactly. 
Exactly. You know, the thing, my wife and I love to take road trips. One of the things that we do, which is a little cathartic, is uh, whenever we go through a small town, we look up the pay scale for teachers in that small town. Um, Everybody's got to have a hobby. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in, I think it was Gray, Wyoming, very small town, very nice school, extremely nice school. Um, about 300-ish kids in the high school. Um, we would have made fifty-five, fifty-six thousand dollars with with our education and our experience. Mm -hmm. um, a teacher in Arizona with a bachelor's degree in every school district in Tucson, with the exception of Catfoot, will never make fifty-five thousand dollars unless they teach an extracurricular, or they are six fifths, which means they have an extra class, um, or they work at you know fast food as well. Uh -huh. Um, that is insane that you can have a teacher with 20 years experience making less than a teacher with, you know, two, three years experience and a master's degree. How are you supposed to keep people here? You know, how are you supposed to do that? And, and here's the other thing that it comes down to, um, when you're thinking about what you want to do in college, money is there partly because we have to pay so damn much for it. Um, but also because, you know, we have to think, well, what do we want to do for the rest of our lives? If you're good at math, you're probably going to think, oh, I'll be an engineer or I'll be a programmer I can make, you know, my, do what my, uh, friend is doing at Amazon right now and make, you know, in the hot, in the low six figures. Mm -hmm. It's a 28, 29 year old. Yeah. Um, starting you, salary is hundred to 200,000 dollars a year. Exactly. Exactly. You know, you could, uh, go for, go for the sciences. Um, you know, do something, you know, uh, in, in a lab, you could uh, just do mathematics, you can get a lot of uh, jobs that pay very well that you can get uh, in mathematics. Uh, or do what we did, history and poli sci, then go to law school and, and make some money as a lawyer. That's what I did. Yeah. <laughs> um, none of those options, anyone considering, you know, well, I need to make I need to make a decent amount of money. No one is going to think I'm going to go to school and be a teacher and I'm going to teach in Arizona for the next 30 years. Yeah. Right? And it's unfortunate because what that means is that, you know, these some of these people going work in Silicon Valley, some of these people, you know, becoming, you know, lawyers would make excellent teachers. Would make phenomenal teachers. And you know, maybe they maybe they love teaching, maybe they love education, they love working with kids, but just the money really holds them back. And so help me God if anybody says, well, the benefits, the benefits suck. I'll tell you that right now. Anytime, go ask your teacher friends. Oh, well, you were um, talking just uh, before about the uh, retirement. The retirement, yeah, the yeah. retirement. The fact that, you know, uh, there's cost of living adjustments. Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm getting a lot of lens flare from behind me here. So I'm okay. going to readjust a little bit and see if I can fix that. Okay. All right. Yeah, let's go with that. Okay. <clears throat> um, so, uh, you know, the benefits for, for teachers, um, you know, one, our retirement system is not the best. Uh, you know, we, unlike most states, you know, if you're a teacher in Illinois, you're a teacher in New York, there's a reason why a lot of them move out here. It's because one, they got paid really well, and two, they have a cost of living adjustment in their retirement. You know, Arizona teachers, as far as I can tell, we, we don't have that. You know, you end up retiring, um, Say you're one of the lucky ones. You end up retiring making, uh, say, sixty thousand dollars a year. You know you've done well as a teacher. You know you spent the last five years teaching. You know, uh, at least three sports a year in order to bump up your income, and you took on an extra class. Um, you'll make seventy-five percent of. Assuming you've been in there for about thirty years, you'll make seventy-five percent of your last couple years' income. So sixty thousand dollars, forty-five thousand dollars for retirement. When you don't have a cost of living adjustment, let's say you retire at 65, let's say you're fortunate enough to live to be 90, like my grandma, that 45 can't buy you as much stuff as it, as it could have. You know, the thing in economics is money is, you, you know, money doesn't really matter. It's what you can actually buy with the money. Yeah. Um, and so that $45,000 a year might be okay when you're 65 to 70, but by the time you get 85, 90, you know, what it could buy is going to be half or less of what it could. Um, and the other thing I want to say about benefits, go find a teacher. There's a bunch of us out in the wild, you know, 
shake a tree and one of us will fall out. <laughs> um, ask us if we got a raise last year. Uh, if we say yes, I want you to then ask, how's our health insurance? Mm. You know, that's that's a lot of what it is. It can be, it's unfortunate, but these, and I don't blame the districts. I don't blame the schools. I don't blame the superintendents who have to make these decisions. Yeah, they're these working within decisions. the budgets they're given. Exactly. And so what they have to, them, them and the unions have to come together and they have to say, where can we squeeze some money? You know, where can we, you know, where can we get, where can we, how can we make this work? And it comes back to essentially a majority in the legislature in Arizona for the last few decades completely abandoning. Uh, so I ran out of uh, memory on my phone and uh, it didn't capture about the last half hour of our conversation. Uh, so we're going to retread a little bit back up to, to where we got cut off uh, and give it a proper ending here. Uh, so you were saying uh, about the state legislature uh, funding education. Yeah, and I, I think I ended on an um. Uh, <laughs> basically, it's about the state legislature not following the Arizona Constitution, not funding our schools in what is required with the spirit of the Constitution. And, you know, that includes our, our higher education. That includes, uh, you know, ASU and U of A, you know, which should by the state constitution be as nearly free as possible yeah so um it's it seems that you are uh, very focused on education as a as a central and primary reason why you're running can you give us a, a rundown of some of the other reasons and and uh purposes you you have in, in seeking this office yeah the main reason why i went into education the main reason i ran the school board last year and I'm running for the legislation legislature legislature this year is to ensure that Arizonans have the tools that they need to improve their lives, improve their families' lives. Um, this includes education. Uh, this includes ensuring that you know all children um, are you know reading proficient, math math proficient, uh, ensuring that they that every you know, high school graduate has the ability, if they choose, to go to you know, community college or university. Not just because their family has, can afford it, um, or because they're okay taking out you know eighty thousand dollars in student loans, um, but because they they want to. Um, and it also means you know making sure that that you know thirty year old, someone my age maybe, um, would be able to you know take classes at the U of A ASU. Maybe they want to get trained in another profession. Uh, you know, that's incredibly important. And the other area, and, and there's there's a lot I can go into, but the other area is with healthcare as well. Um, yeah, if, that was a major portion of what we talked about yeah. that got cut out was uh, how important healthcare is yeah. to, to human development. Yeah, you know, if you don't have access to healthcare, uh, you know, your quality of life is gonna be in peril. You know, right? There was the I, I, I mentioned um, the case of the guy in Florida who won the lottery, and then for the first time in his adult life was able to go see a doctor, and found out he had cancer. You know, that is a horrific story, an absolutely horrific story, and that happened. I, I think that happened in Florida, but it really, you know, how many people are there in Arizona who just didn't win the lottery, yeah, and just end up finding too late that they had. They had something that if they just got it caught, or you know, if it was caught early, they would have been okay. You know, my, you know, uh, you know there's there's a lot of you know, people in my family have had um, have had cancer, and it was just incredibly fortunate that you know we had the health insurance, we caught it early, and we had more time out of you know from my family members. It, yeah. it, it kind of goes back to, and, and this is... I mean, not only is there a yeah. direct loss of life there and a loss of that economic opportunity and security for your family, but, I mean, the amount of, you know, economic development that we, you know, forego just by the fact that a lot of people are chained to their jobs by the simple Absolutely. fact that they have to have insurance and Abs they can't move. They Abs can't they can't start new businesses, follow their dreams. Absolutely. Absolutely. And often, and too often, chained to jobs, chained to jobs that don't pay enough. You know, you should, you know, I, I fundamentally believe in, 
in the 50s, the Soviet premier came over to the United States. It was during a big um, back and forth with, I want to say, it was during the Eisenhower administration. Um, Vice President Nixon was leaving the Soviet premier and was showing off uh, an average home that you know, a factory worker in California could buy or, or Texas could buy, a ranch style home. And basically the Soviet premier was flabbergasted that, you know, a, just a regular worker could buy that. You know, and that was 70 years ago. Yeah. We're at a situation now where I don't know if any of you, if, if you own homes, or if you own a home, or if you're looking to buy a home, you've seen the situation that we have here, you know, go find a job, you know, without a high school, just with a high school diploma, work wherever it is for you know, 10 years, you know, how many, how many, you know, how many jobs are there where you can do that and then own a home and raise a family, you know, that, that should still be the American dream. And it's that, it's, it's the freedom that that gives you, you know, the freedom to, you know, work a good job, work an honorable job, a respectable job, uh, be able to provide for your family, you know, to, uh, to raise a family comfortably, um, and to have the security to, you know, take them to San Diego, you know, once a year, go on another vacation, you know, these are, these are fundamental things that we shouldn't be struggling with in, in 2021. We had this. And, and we, there's no reason why we can't uh, ensure that everyone has it again. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we, we talked about um, when we got cut off was the, the way we finance elections and the role of money in politics. I'd like to, to get your thoughts recorded about that. Yeah, so, yeah, one of the things, money in politics is fundamentally, it's corrupting and it's coercive, um, or corrosive. There's no way to get around it. You know, when we had clean elections, or when we, we started having clean elections in Arizona, you could realistically run and win as a clean elections candidate. Yeah. Um, Representative Powers Handley um, did it in 2016, and, and that was, um, you know, the, the work that she did was phenomenal. It is unfortunate that that has essentially passed. You know, we are looking at races that, you know, for a primary really are going to take between 50 and 70,000. And that's not even counting the dark money that goes into some of those some of these districts. Exactly, a quarter million dollars is not unheard of for oh. a, a state house race oh, or a state senate race. Absolutely, oftentimes with these competitive races, there's more money spent by outside groups and dark money groups than by the candidates themselves. Yeah. And you know, fundamentally, it's a lack of transparency, which is very concerning. You know, we saw recently, uh, I think the Supreme Court heard a case allowing. Um, foreign uh, companies to spend money in uh, certain local elections and uh, statewide elections, um, mostly referendums. Um, it's a case of a Canadian mining company, I think in uh, Montana and another in Maine. Um, and this is incredibly concern concerning. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's so, so now we have a situation where we have a group who ideologically controls the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, first, 10 years ago, deciding that money is political speech and anybody can have it. Yeah. Meaning that 99% of us, you know, essentially have no speech, while 1% of us have, you know, a mega... As much as they can afford. They've got a mega... They've got a, they've got a megaphone and they have the speakers of Metallica concert. Um, and now, they've taken that logic and they've extended to say that, you know, Foreign companies can spend money on certain elections. You know, this is this is absolutely insane. Um, you know, my fundamental belief is that what I'd like to see, perfect world, this is what I, I'd see. If you run, want to run for office, everyone does clean elections. You know, you got to convince two hundred some odd people to give you to give you five dollars each, and then after that, you can you should be able to raise some money. The state gives you some, maybe it's twenty thousand, maybe it's a little bit more, um, but then you're able to also raise money off of, you know, your voters. You know, anybody in the district can give up to, let's say, $100, something, a reasonable amount, um, to a candidate running clean. You know, this would allow someone to, one, be able to prove that they have, you know, the backing of at least a small chunk in their district. Mm -hmm. 
then give them the resources to go out and, and actually campaign and be able, when they're knocking on doors, if they can convince somebody to give them 20 bucks out of their pocket, good for them. You know, this is, this is the, these are the types of elections that we need to see, that we need more of. We need this grassroots um, work, uh, and including grassroots fundraising. Yeah, more empowerment of local small, yeah. do small dollar donors. Yeah, I, I, I do want to say too, after, after all of that, you know, I am not running clean. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the reason is not because I wouldn't love to. I think it'd be great. It is simply because the way the race is set up, the way the system is set up with the dark money coming in, um, I really did not see a way where I could, as a first-time candidate for the state house, win with just $20,000. Yeah, get your name out there and well enough known to be able to compete. Exactly. Um, and be able to, you know, and frank, frankly, you know, have the time to run a small business and... Yeah, and it's a shame that, time. you know, a system is, as much of a model as ours was when it was established, has fallen into disuse and disrepair to, to the degree that it has. That yeah. it's so many candidates who want to run clean are unable to now and still be competitive. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things we didn't get to touch on, which I wanted to ask you about, and now that we're redoing this portion, we might as well, uh, is uh, the impact of disinformation and misinformation uh, on our yeah. politics and, and how we, what policies we can pursue, what practices we can pursue to, to make sure that we're, we're basing public policy and political decisions on, on good quality information. This, this is incredibly tough. Um, you know, this is one of the societal you know societal issues that that I you know it, it's really hard to see how this how this ends um, I, it's not anything new I, I do want to say that yeah. you know we have had you know for example in the mid 1800s we had the explosion of, of newspapers where newspapers really started to take on yeah. a little bit more of not their, to mention the 14th century where we had printing presses and that exactly kicked off the Reformation yeah now, yeah so so we see we see these new these new um, uh, uh, news and information technologies take place and they are disruptive Incredible. they are always disruptive yeah um not always in a negative sense but usually early on in a negative sense uh, we saw this with the rise of fascism for example you know at the same time as yeah. exactly um and we have seen this in the united states ever since they repealed the uh, i think it was called the fair use doctrine mm -hmm. um, 1970s yeah yeah, with the rise of uh, Rush Limbaugh and how Cable News. it has become even worse with, um, you know, thinking internationally. It's not because it's not just disinformation in, in this country. You know, it, it's disinformation um, peddled on uh, social media, especially uh, Facebook and WhatsApp, yeah. um, that have caused you know, genocides and you know, mass atrocities. Yeah. Um, it's been used for good. You know, for example, in the Arab Spring with, with uh, the use of Twitter to organize against dictators. So unfortunately, what it might be at a societal level is we're kind of in a, in a bumpy period. You know, we're in, we're in a weird adolescent you know, period where we have all this technology and we don't quite understand how to use it yet. Yeah. Well, there's also and, the, the asymmetry. I mean, yeah. you know, the future is here. It's just not distributed evenly, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah, one state of, actors learn how to manipulate this th these things before the citizenry does. Yeah. And one of the things that I think is, is critical for this, and, and this is a plug you know, for Blog for Arizona, um, as well as other local media, um, good journalism is the solution. You know, you know, supporting, you know, supporting your local paper, um, supporting you know, local journalists, um, you know, the, the, the Tucson Sentinel, the Daily Star, of course, um, Arizona Republic, and... Uh, uh, and the Capital Times as well. Um, you know, that's that's one way that we can fight this. The other way needs to, you know, the, the political side of it is messaging. You know, candidates, especially in our party, must get better at messaging. We must be able to explain things fairly simply to um, the average voter. Um, most people, you know, most of the people watching this are going to be highly informed voters. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can say, you know, um, 
you know, I can say something, we can start talking about ranked choice, which I think is a great thing that we need to adopt. And I bet most people are going to know what that, uh, who are listening to this are going to know what that means. The average voter is probably using, um, and, and frankly, the right has been better at messaging than we have. They've consistently been better at messaging than we have. We have to do better. Um, and that has to come from elected officials. You know, electeds must be the ones, you know, communicating these policies, you know, reaching out. And I think part of that comes down to having good short-term messaging um, uh, that you can do very quickly um, in, in a quick, you know, quick phone call, you know, knocking at someone's door, sending an email. We also need to get better, and this is something I advocated um, when I was on uh, uh, the PCDP board, is we need to do some essentially deep lobbying, or, or that's a bad way of saying it. We need to do like in-depth outreach uh, to voters, you know, especially in off-year elections uh, or, or off off years. Um, yeah, I've times, heard that called deep canvassing. Things. Deep canvassing. There we go. I knew it was a deep lobby. That's <laughs> um, that's a Koch brothers thing. That's the uh, uh, Institutes for Economic Freedom, the Confucius Institutes. That's deep lobbying. Yeah, deep canvassing. You know, really uh, spending the time when we have it to explain policy and, and educate uh, the citizenry um, on on what we're doing. And you know, it's the the Men in Black quote of uh, you know, Tommy Lee Jones saying, you know, uh, one person is, I mean, I'm going to butcher this. Um, one person is reasonable. A group of people are, you know, out of their mind. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of true. You know, you get a group of people all together at, you know, a rally. You cannot convince them of anything. You knock on someone's door, you look them in the eye, you have that conversation. You can change minds. Yeah. And, and I'm sure most of us are it's the only way to do it. Thing. Yeah. Besides, yeah. well, misinformation campaigns, of yeah. course. <laughs> yeah. One of them is a lot easier than the other. And it's unfortunate that the, um, you know, it's, it's, it's like, you know, candy, right. Or eating, eating healthy. It's a lot easier to eat bad than it is to eat, to eat well. Yeah, it's a lot more compulsive too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, uh, you know, is sort of, uh, in the playbook, uh, this time around with the Republicans is this whole nonsense about CRT. And I think it would be interesting yeah. to ask you about that, given that you ran for school board, uh, you've been a teacher. Uh, how, what is your advice to the party on, on how to fight the misinformation about critical race theory? Never talk about it. Never talk about it. It functionally doesn't exist. Um, that's and, and that's, and, and, oh, you know. when I went to law school, it, we did touch on it once or twice. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and it's, it's one of those, yeah. And, and what happened is, you know, some Republican operative, you know, found that, that word and, you know, deep in the you know footnotes of a, of a law paper, um, they took it out and they said, oh, this is a good talking point. They ran on it. And unfortunately our, par our party decided to run with it. Um, are there issues with how we approach history and pedagogy? Absolutely. You know, should we, uh, you know, understand and educate, you know, the public from, from, you know, children to adults on issues within our society and some of the you know, negative things that happened in, in our history, in our country's past? Yes. Should that be the only thing we talk about in education? Absolutely not. And what this is, is it is a way for the Republicans to distract uh, the voters. You know, because every time, you know, you know, every time a Republican operative says, you know, CRT, what we should do is just pull up, <laughs> we should just pull up a, uh, a whiteboard and just write down, you know, 51, you know, so we're the 51st state in the nation in terms of education funding, you know, behind and including DC, you know, right? That's the thing that matters, you know, the kids, you know, I taught based on the curriculum, but I taught everything the way that I wanted to. I taught to teach my um, to teach my students how to think like a historian and think like an economist. Um, no teacher is teaching critical race theory; it just doesn't exist. Um, what they are teaching is out of textbooks that are twenty years old. You know, they're teaching in classrooms that don't have functioning air conditioning all year round. They're teaching classrooms with, with more students than chairs. These are the issues. Um, and these are the issues that, that voters care about. 
and that's that's really what I'm going to focus on. You know, I'm going to focus on how can we make the lives of students better. How can we ensure that the resources that we are putting in now are sufficient um, uh, for every student to be able to succeed, whatever success means to them. That's you know, it's good that's advice my stance on it. when they yeah. try and distract. Bring it back to the issues that really yeah. matter to people. Yeah, that's good. Um, so, what sorts of committee assignments would you would you seek if you were appointed and or if you were elected? If there's any difference, so I would love to be on education. I think that is that, that that's seems pretty clear. clear. Yeah. Um, however, you know, as as a freshman lawmaker, you are kind of told where you're going to go. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, Al Franken mentioned this, and I, I think that his advice was was right. Is basically he got an assignment. Um, to the Judiciary Committee, which was not necessarily the thing that he really wanted to do, but he ran with it and he did an amazing job um, uh, on that committee. And I, that is the approach that I really will take. Um, I'm going to be put on committees. I do not believe that I will have much say in which committees those are, um, but I will, you know, work like hell to make sure that the Republicans aren't slipping anything, um, you know, unsavory you know, kind of, you know, under, you know, sticking anything as a writer or as a strike all bill or as, you know, or, or bringing up, this is one of the things that they do. And this is, I encourage everyone to do this. Uh, whenever there's a bill that goes towards committee, usually there will be like evidence that they'll bring in to support their bill and explain it a lot more. Occasionally what you can find is some really great gems where the information is completely uh, disconnected from the actual bill. Um, and that is what we, really need. We need someone in the legislature who will, you know, do the hard work of the research of figuring out what this bill actually is and shining a light on what the actual purpose is. Uh, you know, we need someone in there who, you know, is not going to be salty that they got put on, you know, the Natural Resources Committee when they really wanted to be on appropriations. Um, and, you know, that's that's what I will what I will do. You know, I'm, I'm a, a a teacher. I see everything as a learning experience. Um, I know I know a lot about education. I know yeah. I don't know a lot about a lot of other things, but I know that it will be an opportunity for me to uh, work for my constituents. Mm -hmm. um, well, if you uh, are appointed uh, by the Board of Supervisors for the for the next term, what do you see in terms of the opportunities for working with uh, with people on the other side in order to avoid the worst outcomes? So, so the. The political breakdown in the next legislature or in the next uh, it's session fixed. Is, yeah. is fixed. Yeah. yeah, there's going to be 31 Republicans. There'll be 29 Democrats in the House. It's mm -hmm. never going to change. Mm -hmm. um, for me, what that means is I'm going to take lessons from last session. You know, what we saw is the Republicans coming out with absolutely insane far-right legislation in terms of the budget they, they pass a flat tax which because of um, the constitutional amendment back in the 90s functionally can't be repealed because it requires supermajority yeah. um, you know they they you know, try to attack or they try to attack our schools they try to take more money away from public schools and give it as vouchers to go to private schools into private you know into private pockets um, I frankly I will work with Republicans if they will meet me in the middle. And what that means is that we have to, and this is as Democrats, we have to say, here's our starting point. The Republicans have a majority. They have their own bill. If they want to pass their own bill with their own majority, let them. If they want a bipartisan vote, they need to meet us in the middle. And they can act, and they can actually, we can actually have a bipartisan bill. If they're willing to do that, I'm willing to play ball. If they're not, we'll beat them in the next election. Great. Um, I think we can uh, wrap it up there and uh, say thank you to Nathan Davis for joining us for uh, an extended conversation about how he became the person that he is today and what he wants to accomplish in the in the state legislature should he be elected or appointed. So I want to thank you, Nathan. Well, thank you. It's great speaking with you. Great. Have a good one.